Um, I have the, the pleasure of discussing these papers. Um, as I mentioned, I was very excited to be asked to discuss the FinTech panel because FinTech has become, I actually do a lot of research into small business finances and access to credit, and so FinTech has obviously popped up in that, in that realm and has become you know, intriguing in, in how big an impact will it have uh, in that world. Um, each of these papers really illustrate the continued importance of community banks in spite of technological innovations that are sweeping through the financial services industry. I remember I was at a conference about seven, eight years ago, it all blends together, um, where there were a bunch of um, uh, marketplace lenders in the room and online lenders in the room who, who came in and brashly told us that you know, they were going to drive those dinosaur brick and mortar banks out of business. Okay? Um, as we know, this really has not happened. Um, it was a little bit Shakespearean, um, uh, mostly sound and fury signifying nothing. Um, not quite nothing, because it does turn out that consumers, especially our young consumers, as we saw yesterday, um, are really appreciate the convenience of being able to access their money um, electronically from the comfort of their pajamas. But fintechs do not have access to the relatively cheap and stable funding source that are consumer deposits. And they, don't, they also don't have access to the conveniently ready supply consumers to, make that, to give them all the advantages that they thought they were going to be able to take over the market. Okay. So as we, as we stand today, it seems that fintech and banks and community banks are going to have to come to some middle ground and partner and share in, in, in going forward and how to best adapt. Um, and again, these papers just highlight some of the ways that the, 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 the fintech firms and the banks are coexisting pretty harmoniously. Um, uh, as was discussed yesterday, I think it was um, when they were discussing the results of the survey, uh, community banks don't need to be on the leading edge to implement the, the te technology, but they do need to adapt. And the nice part of being a community bank is the ability to adapt quickly. They have community banks can be more agile. They don't have to go through some, as many layers of you know going up the, up the food chart, up the food chain in terms of when things are going to happen and when things can happen. So I think community banks have the potential to have some um, advantages in bringing technology into their models. All right. So now for the individual papers. Um, in the first paper. Kander and his co-author look at the mortgage or originations in the years following the financial crisis. They document a nice steady retreat of the four largest commercial banks away from originating almost 35% of all mortgages in 2008, down to less than 10% by 2016. Over that same period, they also show that non-bank lenders go from 25% in 2008 to over 45% in 2016, all right? Their paper also nicely shows that during this period, the total share of mortgages that are originated by community banks, by small banks, is relatively constant, not a lot of changes. But what the, the interesting part of their results is that they show that in the local markets where the retreat of the, biggest of the big four was the largest, the small banks were the most responsive to this retreat. They were, much more, they were even more responsive than the non-banks. Again, highlighting the importance of community banks. I really liked this paper a lot. There was the, de the analysis was quite detailed, and the authors did a lot of robustness checking. Um, for those of you who care about those details, that was, I thought, really well done. Um, I would encourage the authors to think about the um, implications of the rules on qualified mortgages may have, had, may have on their findings going forward. Um, the rules went into effect January 2015, your data stop in 2016. And so for that last year, you might think that community, because as we heard yesterday, the, qualified, the, the rules on qualified mortgages are quite expensive for the, the community banks to implement. There may be, uh, one might expect that there was a little bit of a retreat in this. Um, the other 
The other thing that you might want to have a look at, are, are there any differences in the mortgages that are being originated to be, that, are, that are held to maturity versus the ones that are sold in the secondary market? I believe you can tell that from the Humda data, which ones. And so as part of your argument about why the community banks have an advantage over the, 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 non, the non-banks is the securitization market that the other guys have to go to the securitization market. You might be able to empirically test this looking at the loans that are set to be held to maturity and the ones that are set to be sold in the secondary market. Um, and as a, a final comment, I, I really appreciate the fact that you tried to bring in consumer preferences um, into, the, into the model and looking at conversion rates. Um, I question how good of an of, of a indicator you have because you're looking at the fraction of uh, loans that were accepted uh, versus the ones that, that were made. And you sort of, you, that is inherently correlated to where the loans, which party the loans went to. And so your, your uh, measure of consumer privacy preferences is correlated to the the measure the dependent variable and what you're trying to measure. And so I would um, encourage you to think a little more deeply about that. But I, I really like the paper and I appreciated the all of the um, robustness checks that went into it. Um, in the second paper, John and his co-authors use Prosper online data to look at the fintech penetration in the presence of small banks in the market. Their results indicate that higher fintech penet- there is higher fintech penetration in areas with lower small bank penet- with small, lower small bank preference. So basically, in a nutshell, they're, they're finding that fintech is more of a substitute for, for large versus small banks, and that that really um, that that makes a lot of sense. We know that small businesses are really are really heterogeneous and they do uh, the, the, the touch and the relationship lending that is associated with small business lending um, is, is makes, gives some uh, credence to this, why this would, why this would make some, some sense. I would question s- including all loans to self-employed businesses in the, the construction of your, your small business loan measure. Um, in, in my mind, this is akin to saying that all uh, credit card debt held by self-employed persons should be c- counted as small business debt. Um, clearly, that's not something that we do at the Fed when we're, we're looking at accounts. Maybe it should be. I know that there is a lot of um, commingling of small business assets and personal assets. I would be more convinced of your results if we could see something that just done for the small business loans themselves without the, the self-employed people. I, I'm not saying that some of that is not inherently going to the small business loans, but I don't think that all of it is. Um, the, uh, uh, the other thing that I would... Um, <coughs> I would question is when you're looking at the the riskiness. I know that I have done uh, of the loans and the likelihood to default. I know that I have done some analysis on the lending club data, which is one would argue a very similar platform. Um, And the loans that are designated for small business purposes go bad much more often than the loans that are not small business purposes. Okay, and so again, this this going back and commingling the all the self-employed loans with the ones designated for small business, your results, I believe, would be made stronger if you could show me that these hold through for, um, for just the, the loans absolutely designated for small business purposes. Um, the other thing is the other thing that I'd like to say is sort of a self-serving thing. And some of the, the introductory remarks you made about 13% of um, uh, there's a 13% reduction in large bank lending to small businesses. This is based on call report data, correct? Okay. So this is based on call report data, which is based on loans less than a million dollars at origination, which we know is not the same as loans to small businesses. Um, and so just be a little bit careful on, on how we quantify and qualify those. And this is more from my perspective that I think there needs to be better data on small business lending, and, and we absolutely do not have it. And so we just need to be a little more cognizant when we're talking about what, what's happening to be aware that this is a proxy for small business lending, but it's not necessarily the same thing as. Okay. 
In the third paper, George and his co-author look at what implications technology implementation has on bank employment. Theoretically, um, if technology and employment are complementary, we should see an increase in employment as technology is increased. And if they're substitutes, we should see a decrease. Um, the authors point out that unlike manufacturing, there's likely to, the relationship is likely to be more complementary. And in fact, that is what the data show. That as technology increases, so too does employment spending. Um, I think that the, the very interesting results, um, I, I would encourage the authors to think carefully about your measures of technology spending and what is included and what is not included. Um, and, and just to be more explicit about this, I, find, I found myself having to read the paper very, very closely to try to figure out exactly what your, dependent, what your, your independent variable was that was measuring technology included. Um, your analysis uh, looks at urban versus rural, um, but I didn't see anywhere in the paper uh, you, you said in your results that you looked at the, the results follow through for small versus large firms, um, but I didn't see those results in the paper, and so that would have been nice and I think particularly re relevant, particularly for this crowd, about you know what does uh, technology spending do for small banks versus large banks. I was excited to see when we had our, our pre-conference call, I, I mentioned to George that um, it would be interesting to see what happened in, in light of all the mergers and acquisitions that have taken, uh, taken place over this period, that if you're not accounting for the mergers and acquisitions, um, it could be that a bank that had particularly strong technology was acquired because of its technology, and then your results are going to be skewed positively. It's going to look like growing, and growing your technology is going to grow your employment. Um, I was uh, pleased to see that George actually, in the two weeks between the call and the conference, went back and checked this out and said that that is not the case, so that's, that's encouraging. Um, and then as a final note on, on the paper, the one thing that I would encourage you to go back and look at is you've talked about spending, you've talked about output, you've talked about employment, but what about profitability? We heard this morning that you know the bank. There was a, a bank that that spent lots and lots of money to get access to Zelle, um, but the cost of it was obviously prohibitively expensive. So my question to you would be, if um, these firms are increasing their technology spending, is it doing it in a way that makes the bank more productive? In in a way that makes the bank more profitable? Because it does. It, in the end come down to whether or not this, this is a sustainable method. Because we can, we can grow and have more technology and hire lots more people and do more output. But if we're not doing so in a profitable way, it's not going to be a good thing uh, for the bank in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, my final comment has to do with, again, when we were on the phone with uh, all of the authors and Michael and I were on the phone call a couple weeks ago in that I think that these papers in particular are at a disadvantage, okay? Because when we're looking at technology, and technology is evolving as rapidly as it is evolving, your results are kind of outdated before you get to the table, right? And, and we know this data is, is not perfect. Data doesn't come to us as quickly as, as we would like it to. And so by the time you get your results, you kind of have to go back and say, oh, well, that's really cool, but is it still relevant today? And this is something I mentioned particularly for the, the qualified mortgages, you know, looking forward, and, and that does, does this still matter in the same way that it mattered previously? But I think this is something that all of the authors should think about. Um, the marketplace lending underwent huge changes in 2017 in terms of, you know, there, there are a lot of securitization problems, their default rates started to increase. And so what impact do those, do, does the um, things that are going on in the market today, does that make your results hold through? Does it make them more or less relevant in what's going on? And I would encourage George in the same way in terms of technology, you know, do these things still hold through? 
as an economist, I recognize that you know we're not going to go back and update our data on a daily basis. It's not possible. We'll never get a research paper written. <laughs> um, but just being able to take into account that you know as time goes forward and our data become a, a little bit stale, what does that mean for our results, and can we put them into context? All right, but I enjoyed all the papers, and I really appreciated you guys' feedback and everything on the call, so thank you. All right. So next, we get the pleasure from, he uh, from hearing from Michael Bush, who is the president and CEO of Chicago-based Burling Bank and Burling Ventures, a wholly owned subsidiaries of Burling Burlington Bank Corp. Michael has more than 25 years of banking experience focused in areas of regulatory compliance, risk management, operations, marketing, client services, and business development. And so now we're going to get Michael's feedback on how in the context of his bank, which mm -hmm. cannot be any more different from the, the Amish bank that we heard from yesterday right. in terms of location, where you get his feedback on, on, on your thoughts on what the research is and how that works into your day-to-day -day business. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy, and, and congratulations to the authors and all the authors in the room. Put a lot of work into this, um, and it's much appreciated, and certainly to the Federal Reserve and CSBS and FDIC uh, for having me. Uh, as a Chicago Cubs fan, I was hoping to extend my stay for a playoff game, but it's just not uh, in the cards this year. Also, it wasn't fun uh, seeing the St. Louis Blues are, are going to probably receive their uh, rings uh, this evening, so for the Blackhawks fans, I'm sure we're... Uh, you're sharing their uh, pain, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, pleasure to be with you here. You know, I, I'm happy to contribute my perspective um, as a community bank president. Um, I am not a technologist. Um, I sit at that in, in the nexus right now. Of what's the next step for us uh, in adapting technology and uh, in following through on our mission, which is to remain relevant uh, to our clients and specific to our <laughs> clients. As Tracy mentioned, you know, our our bank. Um, is very different uh, than Bird and Hand. Um, the, the closest the Amish get to Burling Bank is probably a few bake sales at the train station. Um, and, and yet our mission is the same, which is to serve our clients with distinction and provide them um, with the banking products that are relevant <laughs> to their lives. Um, quick background on Burling Bank. Uh, we're 30 years old. Uh, we have a single location um, in Chicago, Illinois. State Chartered Non-Member uh, Bank with the FDIC as our primary regulator. Uh, only 18 full-time employees, uh, 140 million in assets, and 100 million in loans. Um, this is our bank, but not all of it. Uh, we, uh, we are on uh, LaSalle Street, uh, next door neighbors to the Chicago Federal Reserve, so close that they can probably hear our conversations. Um, uh, we're on the first floor of the Board of Trade Building. And so this also goes into a little bit, which I'll touch on later, is what is a community bank and how will we define community going forward? So for Burling Bank, um, even though our MSA is all of Cook County, it was really a vertical community, a neighborhood that um, was based around a common industry, which is the trading community. Uh, some of you who have been to the Board of Trade may recognize this is the, um, this is the grain room, the uh, corn pit specifically. I worked in that pit for 20 years, uh, 15 years of it uh, really good. The last five years, uh, we went you know, through the transition of a te massive technology disruption um, with algorithmic trading. And so um, both as a former trader, I've seen that up close and what it meant for my own profession. And then as a banker also, this is on the fourth floor of the Board of Trade, and we we're on the first and second floor of the bank. Uh, so kind of go up and down during for the open and close of the of the um, grain markets, um, what that meant for our community base, and while to an outsider that looks like mass chaos and I would call it managed chaos, that frenzy of activity was how futures uh, contracts uh, uh, got consummated. Um, when I look at that picture, though, I see individuals who had exchange membership loans through Burling Bank one of three banks in Chicago that did exchange membership loans. Um, mortgages, lines of credit, college tuitions that need to get paid, large, low-cost, sticky deposits. Uh, traders would like to park their money in savings accounts. They took enough risk on the floor. They wanted to know it was sitting there. And so there was a massive disruption to us when, um, when the, today's trading floor looks like this which is one individual eating his lunch at a desk, trading <coughs> multiple markets on a global basis, 
And that is progress, and it is more efficient, but it's still very disruptive to a certain community. And so it forced us to look at technology um, uh, in a different way and also maybe to be a little bit more proactive as to how can we take some of our unique attributes and our physical location, our relationship with our regulators and our client needs and be at least entering the conversation a little bit more of what is the future of banking? How do we connect with our clients? How do we find each other? Um, because we're not in a rural community where we may be the only option or maybe one of two options. Uh, on LaSalle Street, there's every big bank flag flying that you can imagine, and we are certainly uh, the David amongst all the Goliaths. So just want to touch on some uh, themes, and this is my last slide, so don't expect any more. I don't have coefficients, regression analysis, or anything like that. Um, but just want to touch on some uh, themes um, that I think are relevant um, as uh, President Harker mentioned this is kind of the, um, the negative of going on the second day. Many of these things have been touched on. Um, but I want to lend my uh, perspective from a community bank president on maybe how we're addressing them um, and some things that together uh, we can do to, um, to move it forward. Uh, definitely seen in the last five years it go from competition to collaboration where everybody was going to come in and, and disrupt us. Um, there is now a desire, uh, both in some evidence and I think anecdotal conversations, um, where some of these fintech firms and some of them brand names want to partner uh, with a community bank. Um, from a, um, if they're going to buy a bank, if they're going to purchase a bank or make a strategic investment, one could argue that a, a smaller bank and their definite, um, I guess, variations on, on asset size and how you define that. You know, we're 140 million. We can consider ourselves small. A billion dollar bank feels big to us. Ten billion dollar feels like they're in a, a different um, uh, world. But from an acquisition standpoint, you would probably want something that's bite sized, and you would also want a um, a collaborative, nimble uh, management structure um, that you're able to get that feedback uh, through. From a regulatory standpoint, I think small banks make good partners because they know that those bank presidents and that management team have their arms wrapped around the risk in that bank and what that bank's focus is and what it does. Um, and so it, it, it lends itself, I think, to uh, potentially a, a, um, a better universe for trying to move this uh, FinTech and banking partnership forward together. Um, not all small banks are set up for that. Not all small, small banks need to do that. And, and that collaboration can take many forms, which I'll uh, come to later. Um, one of the, the obvious difficulties is that the pace of innovation and the pace of regulation are moving at two different speeds. And the community bank presidents are stuck in the middle. Uh, we have a lot on our plates, respectively, um, and yet we're um, supposed to be part technologists. I think it was Julianne mentioned it last night that we've done a good job on the risk management part that came out of the crisis. And so we collectively need to give um, all of ourselves some permissioning to embrace innovation and figure out what does that mean for our bank and how can we help the system together uh, move that forward. Uh, there's a difference between saying, and I loved what I heard, particularly from um, Chairman McWilliams yesterday um, with every part of her speech, and I was, I was really encouraged at what's coming out of um, uh, the statements from many of our leaders in, in the system. Uh, doing is another thing. And so how does that translate through your regulatory bodies, uh, both at the state and federal leg, um, um, level, um, and from the fintech partners and from the banks? Um, so that will be a challenge uh, for us going forward. Um, but as, as Chairman McWilliams uh, mentioned, that framework of how we regulate banks needs to involve and encompass technology um, and provide us the ability to... Uh, to have a safe space, it doesn't mean we need to move away from, um, from safe and sound practices. It's just for the right relationships and the right banks to, to innovate a little bit. Uh, core data processors has been mentioned a couple times. Uh, they have a strong ability to help or hinder uh, us going forward. Most banks will get their technology from the core providers. Uh, they will not be incubating ideas. Um, and from a vendor management standpoint, it's difficult to know which fintechs to partner with. 
um, and, and, uh, and which ones have staying power. Are they what we jokingly call two dudes on a laptop, which no offense, that's where a lot of um, great ideas come from, from the dorm rooms, um, that we know all those stories, um, but that doesn't work in banking. Uh, we have to prove out from a vendor management and security uh, standpoint that they're here to stay. Who wants to introduce a product that might that vendor might not be around in a year? Uh, that's not going to work for our clients. Uh, community formation um, talked about that uh, a little bit previously with this idea of what is a community bank in the future? Is it a geography, which so much of our regulation and especially CRA is based upon, and for good reason? Um, you know, the charge of a community bank is to serve its community, and that's, in, and that's currently defined mostly as geography. But in the future, is it shared interests? Uh, is it an industry that people are coalescing around? What <coughs> banks are the right ones to service that? What permission, again, can they get from the regulators to do that? Um, that's, I think, an emerging area. I think that'll be particularly um, something that we need to um, concern ourselves with, with a younger generation. Um, that moves around a lot. They're finding each other on social networking uh, based on shared ideas, shared stories, and what they care about. Having said that, there's, a, there's an opportunity, I think, for technology to, to bring about, a, in a good way, hyper-local uh, community banking because you're able to use technology to identify those people to reach out to them. And we, especially the community bankers, need to do a better job of telling the story of why a small uh, bank either uh, located in a rural era, area like Bird and Hand or in a urban area like Burling Bank is a better partner for them. We need to have the technology that allows them to interact with the bank in, in the way they, they want to, but also tell the, the bank local story, not unlike craft beer, craft spirits, farm to table, it's the same messaging, but you have to provide the technology so they can interact with you in the way that they want to. Um, IT versus digital strategy, I look at this as kind of uh, plumbing versus compelling products. Um, IT, we go through those exams. Uh, quite honestly, it's kind of scary when you think about all, you know, the different entry points and what can happen with cybersecurity. Um, that is done by a different group than the digital strategy as far as product outreach. How do we interact with our clients? What's compelling? Um, so for my thoughts, they are much less about uh, IT today and more about digital strategy. Um, we're at, at that nexus of figuring out what's the, what's the next move for Burling Bank um, and what digital strategy works out well for us. And there's several ways to, um, to do that. And, and, and we want to be, our ambition is to be a FinTech forward, future ready bank. Sounds great, what does that mean? So FinTech forward in that we are, are are actively engaging in conversation with thought leaders in that area, engaging our regulators on what we want to do to be very overt and explain to them on, on why we're doing it um, and how that will benefit our clients that exist today and the clients we want to get tomorrow. Um, to analyze your core and what capabilities they say they have and, what capa and, and how quickly that can get delivered to you, how expensive it is, um, and how easily you can integrate that into your bank. Another option is to incubate some ideas. Could you have some entrepreneurs and residents that use the bank as a lab uh, and probably get to market quicker with a better product? Um, that might be appropriate for some banks. It might not be some others. I know that some in the, in the audience are doing a great job of that. Uh, not many banks are doing, are doing that. It may not be appropriate for everybody. Um, but that's something, especially given our unique bank attributes that we're looking into. There's a pretty vibrant FinTech scene in Chicago. Uh, the regulators are, are used to technology and advancements in Chicago with the uh, futures uh, and options capital of the world. Um, so that's kind of a, a natural with all the colleges and, and the uh, experienced human capital in Chicago. May not be as appropriate for a rural bank. Um, so how will we gain that technology? And, and then from, uh, I think, a, a systems and approach standpoint that we're future ready and, and malleable enough that with the change that's coming in, in banking, uh, and, we, and we're seeing this, you know, we're trying to evaluate this in real time, which is difficult. It's difficult for the authors uh, because some of the uh, information um, is dated, um, and it's difficult for the bankers that you're trying to kind of be all things to all people right now. We have aging clients that want to come in and talk to Mary Beth and, and make sure that everything is taken care of. 
And then we have new clients that may never come into the bank. But they still may want to know at the end of the day when they run into the problem, and they will run into a problem, uh, that they can pick up the phone and talk to the bank president or chairman and have them work, and have them work through that problem. Also, as they, as they um, age and have kids and maybe get married and, um, and have a professional career, their needs will change. Right now, they might be pretty basic. Uh, and so some of those solutions that are out there in the fintech world are appropriate for them. Um, but later on, they may need some advice, some guidance, and that's where a community bank that is willing to take the time to have that conversation um, and, and hold their hand as much as they need it held uh, through that process. I think that there's, it's, you know, it's a relevant uh, value add for them. But the challenge for us um, as we go through this in partners is community banks need strong, capable, willing part partners, both in FinTech from the cores and also from the regulators. We, that has to be a, a larger community that's doing it together in order to move this ball um, forward. Again, to each his own, on, uh, for each bank, they're perfectly capable of determining what is best for their community that they serve. Um, but the, the challenge, I think, for all of us is, is that you know, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that community banks are a strong and vital part of the banking fabric of the US system. How do we help them remain relevant um, from a regulatory standpoint um, and, and alleviate some of that pressure uh, that we feel um, and allow us to kind of innovate without, um, I guess, the, the, the fear that we would do something wrong. We don't go into any decision uh, trying to do something wrong. We're trying to do it right. Uh, but how do we use those resources to make sure we're on the right path? Thank you.